right, let's see if we can sort this thing out. I'm uh, very honored to be here. It's good to be back in, in D.C. I used to spend some time here in the 2000 era with that project, but it's been a while. So I'm going to start a little narrative story with the personal computer. Uh, it actually, of course, had, as you saw earlier, a large impact from computing research. Um, but I want you to realize that you thought of it, at least at the time, as a device for running office applications, for running math and science applications, at least if you're a student, uh, perhaps for uh, storing things. All these were applications that really ran on the PC, and that was really kind of our starting point. That plus this other thing called the Internet, which you might have heard of. It's pretty successful. Um, you'll hear this little noise, which basically means this is computing research. <laughs> And in particular, many things uh, came out of computing research that led to the Internet. Uh, and so every time you see that little dollar sign, that is a reminder that it wouldn't be here without computing research. Now, another application uh, that is an early one, the, really the first one from the Internet, is email. Uh, that's also both the readers and the servers from computer science research. And at least at the time, it's something you would think of as an application. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Another application you might have heard of is the web browser. Uh, that was, actually came out of uh, uh, the Supercomputer Center in Illinois, and Larry Smarr, who led it at the time, was here, is here. Um, this led to uh, Netscape. It also led to what's now Firefox and many other browsers. But again, this is an application. And what's interesting about this application uh, is that it's, it's an access application. It's going to give us access to this thing called the Internet. Um, that certainly includes USA.gov, which I can personally say came from government research. Um, but I want you to realize that it's the access here that matters, right? If, if there's a big change that's occurred from the time of the PC to now, it's that the PC is now an access device. It's an access to the web originally. And so what we're really going to do is we're going to start moving things back into this center diagram. So the first one to go back actually was email. Uh, if you've used Hotmail or Gmail or Yahoo Mail, this is what's going on. You take an application that used to run on the PC, and now it's effectively running inside the infrastructure. Right? And this is really when the web became the cloud. Right? What makes it the cloud is that the application is running in the infrastructure and not on your PC anymore. Right? And what we're going to do is we're going to move all of the applications into the cloud. Right? There's, it's in transition. They're not all there yet, but they're all going there. It's just a matter of time. Right, so now the browser is essentially this universal client. And if you heard about the browser wars, it's really about the fact that access to the cloud is so important, it's the only application that matters now. Right, so uh, it's been great for innovation, by the way. Uh, this, all this shifting is good for innovation. Uh, and of course, once you put things in the cloud, you need a whole bunch of other infrastructure, including databases and high-performance computing. Uh, so you didn't need those things as much on your PC, although they were there, but fundamental to moving them into the cloud is to have uh, core database research and core high-performance computing research, both with 20, 30 years of very impressive track records. So what we're going to do now is uh, look inside the cloud and uh, think about how we actually support all these users. So it's worth pointing out that there's a, about a billion and a half users. Uh, that's more people that are in the developing world. So developing world is about 1.1 billion. So we've got another half a billion from developing countries, which is a good sign. And that is the fastest growing area. So this is a world, it really is planetary scale. And I think one of the great challenges for the next decade is to really enlarge that number to at least the 3 billion that have cell phones. And that seems very achievable. Now, it's not just PCs, it's all kinds of other devices. It includes uh, your laptops, obviously, but also home networks, things like that. Uh, and you don't have to be connected via Ethernet anymore, right? It's another very important change is that you can be wireless. In fact, so the cloud is accessible not just on your PC, but really anywhere. And of course, wireless has all kinds of stuff that came from computing research. Uh, all kinds of protocols, coding theory, even the fact of how do you fit a radio onto an integrated circuit. All that had to be sorted out. Again, decades of, of incredible work there. Now, you also probably heard of this thing called the iPhone. Uh, this is, from my perspective, a PC in a very convenient form factor. It's in fact more powerful than the original PC by quite a bit, even though you think of it as a phone. Uh, but if you just think what original PCs could do, they can't do as much as the phone can do. 
but its main value here is again that it's an access device. And of course, there are many things in the iPhone that are also from computing receipts, including the operating system, the sensors, which Deborah Estrin will talk about a little bit, and even the, the fancy interface, that was done uh, in some form even in the 60s, again by uh, Doug Engelbart. And so long history of things that get synthesized. Synthesized is the right word. I like that word that Ed picked. So all these things are, are access to the cloud. And really, in some sense, this is, is modern computing. It's, the computing is, is away from you, and you have access to it. And what matters is, is your access device. So now I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper on this cloud. The, uh, we have a whole bunch of applications that we want to run. Um, and one of them that's new is, uh, is groupware. And uh, this actually should have a dollar sign too, I decided, but I, I added it too late. Um, I bring this up because the, unlike the personal computer, the cloud is not personal, right? It is fundamentally a groupware application, which means there's things you can do by the fact that everyone else is in the same cloud that you are that you couldn't do on your own PC. So chat is certainly one of them, and they're probably the original one, but everything that, that, that derives from groupware and, and internet relay chat, so all modern kinds of social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter, Skype, voice over IP, all that stuff depends on the shared nature of the cloud, right? Very important distinction that's quite enabling by itself. Now, let's look at one particular application, say it's an Office application. Uh, in fact, you, this could be Google Docs. This is an a, a Office application that you can use in the cloud now. And how does it run? Well, conceptually, it works like it did before. It runs on a PC, except now the PC is in the infrastructure instead of the one in front of you. Uh, now, it's not really what happens, but it's not a bad model. Uh, the problem with that model is that if you have a lot of users, they can't all use the same PC, right? The thing will crash. So the solution to that historically was you'd buy a bigger computer. And there certainly was a time where if you wanted a bigger server, you'd go to IBM or DEC at the time, and you'd buy a bigger machine, and you'd install it, and now you can support more users. Uh, this has a problem, because eventually you can't buy a bigger machine. You've bought the biggest machine that you can buy, uh, and it crashes. So what do you do? Well, you use a whole bunch of little machines, and I think this is why I get to give this talk, because I did this part. This is the clustered computing that uh, Alfred talked about. And this is really the modern architecture of the cloud. Every cloud application runs on a collection of essentially commodity PCs that are working together to run a varying number of applications. And the advantage of this approach basically is it's super cost effective because you're using entirely commodity components. They really are commodity. You order them in, in truckloads, literally. And you can scale to be an arbitrarily large computer. So if you need a bigger computer, you add more nodes, and now you have a bigger computer. Right? That's the fundamental advantage to this approach. Another fundamental advantage to this approach is that if one catches on fire, you can actually quickly move the application to a different node. Right? This is how we keep these systems highly available. Now, Originally, when we did this, each application kind of had its own cluster. There was a cluster for the office applications, and there was a cluster for the database applications, and they kind of were independently managed, and that was a big hassle. So the solution to that is to go uh, virtual. And so virtual machines were invented. This came out of Stanford. And what they're going to do is they're going to make the servers interchangeable. So we take all of the servers that are now interchangeable, and we can basically just make a bunch of those. And now these, all of our applications run directly on this, any of these sets. And that means we can move them around. So let's look into this a little bit more. So what I'm going to show you is, is a graph that's going to basically show, as the demand for a given application varies over time, how does the infrastructure respond? And this is pretty much what happens. Not at the not in a five-second interval like I'm going to show you. Um, so to make it a little easier to track, we're going to use colors for applications. So I'll, I'll look at the red one for uh, math and science and the yellow one for databases. And we'll watch this one twice if I can do it twice. We'll see. Let's be silent. All right. Here we'll see it again. Maybe. <laughs> So what happens is as demand goes up and down, 
the infrastructure is just allocating, deallocating the, the application servers onto the virtual nodes. Because the nodes are virtual, it's very flexible how you can mix and match these things. So basically, if, if suddenly there's a, an onslaught of people searching about some new hot topic, then you need more search engine nodes, that's great. This is how you get them, right? Very dynamic. We'll come back to the issues that causes us in a minute. This is called elasticity. And basically what it's going to mean for innovation is that if you have an idea that's a good idea, you can actually deploy it on one node, and if it takes off, you can actually rent on demand as many nodes as you need. Right? So anybody can create a service that can scale to a billion users. Literally anyone. In fact, I could do it today. I just need to get a billion users. Right? There's no technical limitation. So how do these clouds actually get built is the last little thing I want to talk about. Um, we don't have 16 nodes, uh, we have many. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put them in containers for lots of reasons. And a co modern container, this is actually for just dated from yesterday, uh, new Microsoft data, they're getting 1,700 CPUs and 3,400 gigabytes into one shipping container. So it's basically, it's, a, it's the new unit of computing. So if you build a cloud, you build it out of containers, and each one has a tremendous data center in it. And then what you do is, is essentially exactly what, how the cloud is built, is you take a whole bunch of those containers and you put them in a parking lot. And Microsoft is building a new data center in Chicago where it's literally a parking lot full of containers. Right? Right? And when you put a bunch of containers together, you get unbelievable scale. Right? So this is how it can support a billion users, pretty much to do whatever they want, even if we don't know what it is yet. Right? Extremely flexible, and this it's really what's going to change everything else. So at least it's some opportunities. Uh, starting in the mundane a little bit, software engineering, which is how do we make software, is completely broken. This is a problem and an opportunity. Uh, in particular, historic software engineering was about how do we build something that I can give to you and has to work perfectly the first time. Right? Now, Everything that you're using is in infrastructure that I operate. So in fact, if it isn't working, I can fix it in a minute. I don't have to redistribute you some new CD so that you can get the new version. I can change the version all the time. And in fact, what we're gonna do is we're gonna run different versions every day and we're gonna run different versions for, the, for different people. For example, if I have an idea, I wanna try it, I can just try it on 10 users at random, see how they like it, and if everyone likes it, I'll just roll it out to everybody in the next hour. Right? Tremendously flexible. Right, so this is not how we build software today, uh, except for somewhat ad hoc. Uh, we need to fix this. And I'll also say one of the most amazing things about this is how easy it is now to build a website that I said could handle a billion people. It's really remarkable. You do not need to build a data center. You do not need to have particularly many IT people that run a, a center. You can essentially just set it up uh, if it takes off, you can rent more nodes from an Amazon or a Google and uh, take a, pretty much pay for the computing infrastructure as you need on, a, on an hour by hour by basis, right? So we need to rethink software engineering. Energy is also a, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the cloud is already half a percent of the global carbon footprint, uh, but it's the fastest growing segment. So left unchecked, this is going to be a problem. Uh, the good news is it's actually much easier to optimize energy for the cloud than it is for your home PC. Right? By, because we put it in a central spot and because someone's paying the bill, a single group is paying the electric bill, right? the electricity is the largest single fraction cost of running the cloud. Right? So there's a great economic incentive to fix it. And in general, because we've centralized things, there's also tremendous opportunities to rethink servers, rethink the cooling, even rethink the processors. So all that is up for, for discussion now in a way that hasn't occurred in, in at least 20 years. So that can be a big win, but it's yet to come. Finally, before I wrap up, security and privacy, I think, is the greatest risk in this space. The cloud has not only all the data that you put in it, but essentially a long history of every place you've been. Now, it's not necessarily all collected together, but it essentially is all in the cloud. And in fact, the cloud has tremendous computing capacity, and you'll hear about machine learning in a minute, and it can learn a lot about you, much more than not even what it can learn today, but what it can learn as its ability to learn improves over time. All right, so left unchecked, this is a great risk. The good news is there are lots of things that research can do to improve this, um, wide open topics and how to figure out how is information leaking, can you track it? If you could track leaks, then you could start to have uh, 
liability and things like that that would make a practical difference in privacy. Uh, how do you enforce deletion? If, if I want to delete something that's in the cloud, how do I know it gets deleted? I have no idea right now. Right? And what rights should you have as a user to the data about you or the data that you put in the cloud? Can you take it out whenever you want? Or if, once you put it in, is it in forever and who knows? Right? Wide open questions here. So great risk, but great opportunity, lots of room for research. And just to wrap up, I'd say nothing else I want you to realize that you all have a supercomputer. Every time you do a search, you're using a supercomputer. You use it from your phone, you're using it from your laptop, you're using it from your PC. The only people that don't get to use it is people that don't have access. So it's worth reminding ourselves that it, not everyone in the U.S. has good access to the Internet yet. That is a fixable thing, and the cloud is going to be that important. We have to fix this in the next 10 years. And finally, and this you'll hear many other things about this today, the cloud should change how everything else in life is done. It's that profound. It should change healthcare. Gene Mars will talk about that some. It should change education, which it, it has a little bit. We already have students that use supercomputers for their class projects, right, at the college level. That'll be in the junior high school level, I would say, within a few years. There's no technical impediment to that, right? Any junior high school student can run a large-scale simulation on a supercomputer right now. It's, it's, no, it's technically feasible for them to do that at, at a very reasonable price, 10 cents an hour per, per node. We'll hear about science uh, today. Again, revolution in progress, tremendous opportunity. Cloud simply makes it more powerful. And finally, to end on, a, I think, the, a tremendous uh, positive note, this is a U.S. phenomenon. All the clouds at the moment are essentially operated by U.S. companies. And this is a, a strategic advantage. I don't know how to make use of it exactly, but it does mean we should continue to invest in it because this is, is this is the future. We own it. Let's not screw it up. All right.